Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the broadcast. I'm your host, Josh Reeves. This is the Thursday, September 26, 2019 edition of the broadcast. And yes, indeed, this is our 12-year anniversary show. Hard to believe, but also not hard to believe. It's been a long haul, but uh, we are here with you. Thank you so much for being here for another edition of the show. 12 years of the global reality. And it's, uh, it's unbelievable. And it's also 12... Uh, this this month, twelve years ago, was also significant. Not only just for uh, the fact that's when this broadcast started, but also because that's also when my first film, Nine Eleven: New World Rising, came out and uh, premiered at the Lakewood Theater that year. And it's also uh, don't want to forget the third significant thing that happened twelve years ago this week. Not only the beginning of the show. But also the first interview that I did for the show, which happened um, two days after uh, the first show, which was the interview with former Canadian diplomat Peter Dell Scott, where uh, I had, uh, well, how that all came about was even before I was doing the show. I'd had the premiere. I was putting together the event. This is back when uh, I was still doing the 9-11 Truth stuff back then. And we were putting together the event for the the uh, premiere of the film. We wanted to have um, someone come and speak as well. And uh, I can't even remember how he even got on the left. I guess he wrote a 9-11 truth book or something at one point i can't even remember what it was i was just given a name i think it was somebody else in the group that i was with at the time i was given a list of names of people that they would like to see be there so i uh i just went through and started contacting everybody it wasn't because i was uh you know already a fan of his or anything of that nature why why i even had him on but I contacted him to be at the, uh, this was a few months. I mean, this would have been in the summer of 2007 or so. I think it was, we were getting ready, you know, a couple of months before September. So probably it was like July or something like that, 2007. And uh, he contacted me back and said, well, I can't, I can't come to your event. Blah, blah, I have another event. Sorry. And then, um, that would have been like July, and then there it was. I, I, I believe it was uh, it was either the day of the this show premiered. The, the very first show it was either that day or the next day. I can't remember which one, one or the other. Where I got a, a, another email from Peter Dell Scott, and he said, "Hey, I can. Uh, I just want to let you know I can come. I can come do your event now. I'm free." Blah blah. blah. And I said, "Well." You know, dude, you missed it, man. That was fucking two months or two three months ago I contacted you about. Remember I told you it was like middle of September. You missed it. It's done. It's over with. It's We got William Rodriguez. And uh, then I was like, but actually I just um, started a radio show. I just did like the first episode yesterday. How would you like to come on tomorrow and be my guest? And, uh, and he said yes. So, um. All, you know, I, that, that's the thing is when, when, when you start like a new show or when people don't know who you are, they don't, they have no idea what you've done previous, you know? So that was, uh, I have to say the guy was the, the guy was running the network at the time. Rough. I, I started, see, I started ruffling people's feathers, started scaring people right out of the gates because I came out like second or third, second show or something. And I got a fucking heavy hitter, dude. I wasn't just bringing on, yeah, you know what I mean? I wasn't just bringing on some goofball or something. I was bringing on a former Canadian diplomat, a respected author, you know, a stately figure. Uh, who the fuck is this guy? You know, so people were suspicious of me right out of the fucking gates. And, I, and then 
uh, I have so I have you know I have Peter Dell Scott on. We we're having a good conversation. We're talking about uh, you know the various think tanks and 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 secretive groups and the powerful groups and uh, and all that stuff. We start talking about the Bilderberg and we start talking about uh, you know Carlisle Group and all that trilateral commission CFR the usual suspects. And then that's when he you know drops it on me and i couldn't and it was it was weird because at the time it was like you know come we were doing it over skype or whatever and sometimes stuff is but it's doing it on your end how you're hearing it but it's it was being recorded coming through somewhere else so sometimes you wouldn't hear that on the end but it would get so right as he was telling me well, there's this other group. Actually, those groups are not nearly as powerful as they used to be. And there's another group, and they're more powerful than all those groups. And and it's like, and he's like, and they're called the. And I couldn't hear. I was like, what the? And I was like, and so I could hear it. And um, you know, he talked about it for a little bit, and then I went back and listened to the when it was rebroadcasting, and and I could hear it clearly. I hear what he said, and that's when he said CMP, the Council for National Policy. And uh, little did I know I was already on to this group in in other aspects. I had a blog that I used to do uh, for like a year or two before I ever started my show. And I found this old post that I'd made on there where I just copied and pasted it from somewhere else. You know, I wasn't purporting it to be my own. I was just taking stuff that I'd found, put it up there. Uh, and it was stuff about the, about the Kennedy assassination and their connect and the connections to like the, the Hunt family uh here in Dallas, which I was, you know, very interested in. And he'd had uh mention of the John Burt Society stuff. So I already was on to the John Burt Society thing. So I was already on to it a little bit and, and little did I know had already had already posted an article which actually had mentioned the CMP in it and just didn't, you know, it didn't connect when Peter Dill Scott mentioned it. It didn't connect that I'd already read about this, probably seen the group's name a few times, but you know how it is. If you don't know anything about something you can see you can see it written or talked about and it just doesn't mean anything to you because you don't don't know anything about it. So yeah, that's in, and, and that's so when I, I when I listened to that rebroadcast, I went back and started. Uh, that's when I started doing the research, and that's uh, I mean everything changed. That was uh, that was that was really wild. It, it's uh, looking back on it, you know, when you're when you're going through something, when you're living it, you know, even if it's overwhelming, it's uh, you know you're in the moment, you're in the now, you. It also sometimes stuff like that doesn't hit you, you know, until years later. You don't really uh, feel or see the impact of it. But it was a huge thing, man, because I was, uh, you know, here I was. I'd been, I had been doing research. I started doing research. Um, I've talked about this many times, but I, I literally, I'm not kidding you. I started researching when I was eight years old. It's not a joke. Third grade, I I, I started researching UFOs, Bermuda Triangle. Um, whatever I could get my hands on. And then as I got older into my teen years, um, I've talked about this before, but it's crazy. I didn't even find out about the Kennedy assassination. Uh, other than just little things I would hear as a kid, but not much. I, I didn't really even find out about that until I was like 14 or 15. It was right around the time the Oliver Stone JFK movie came out. And, uh, the little podunk school I went to had a, uh, had a copy of Crossfire by Jim Mars in the uh, in the library at school. I Man, I did a book report on that some bitch like five, six different times. Uh, to teachers never caught on. I do it running on multiple teachers across multiple years and shit. Nobody ever caught on. So that was kind of how. But to to be honest with you, that was kind of how it was just something I was I was interested in because I had never heard people talk. People didn't talk about it. You know, I grew up in Dallas. I grew up all around Dallas. Lived here my whole life. It wasn't uh, people just didn't talk about it. Um, so I never even heard anything about it. And then, uh, when I started finding out about it, you know, I, I just, I just asking everybody I knew. And that's when my grandmother showed me, you know, these old news, she had newspapers that were in plastic from the day that looked pristine. And I started reading the newspapers from the day of the assassination, the Dallas Times Herald. I think she had a copy of the Dallas Times. I think she had a copy of the Dallas Times Herald and the Dallas Morning News. She had two different newspapers, both in plastic. But uh, yeah, I, it was. Uh, you know, I was already seeing. I was seeing stuff in those 
news reports that were like discrepancies. I can't particularly remember what. I think it was something to do with. Uh, I think it was something to do with, with with the idea of there being, you know, possibly more than one shooter involved, something like that. I can't remember what it was, but there was something that was like, I was reading this newspaper and I was like, wait a minute, this is not what like the official stuff says on this now. Not even close, you know. And that's what kind of led me to, to digging into it and uh, and looking into that stuff. So, you know, I when I started... I got heavy back into researching again around 2000. Uh, oh, it would have been when I was working for fucking TurboTax uh, doing, this, doing, their, doing their software. Um, no, this was probably 2001. Yeah, I was right around 9-11 because that was really the big thing. I've talked about that before that kicked me back into gear was the day of 9-11. I was just like, fuck this shit. So when... Um, when I started the show, I, you know, like I, like I said, I had, I had never had any desire to do a radio show or anything like that. And you got to remember this is podcasting wasn't even a thing yet. And, uh, I'd had all this gear, music gear, uh, for recording that was just sitting there. So when someone suggest, suggested I do a show, it started because I, I, I went and, uh, guest hosted for someone's, someone, another person's show. And that person happened to be in New York for the 9-11 stuff, had me co-host while they were out of town. And then some chicanery and shit went on with that, with that person. And then they got fired and there was an opening on the network and everybody was saying I should have my own show. And so that's how it all started for me. I never really, I didn't have the desire, but I, you know, I knew I had, uh, I knew I had a lot of stuff. And a lot of information that I'd never heard anybody else talk about ever anywhere else, you know, you know, in any other radio shows, or books, or anything. And uh, I, I really thought at that time that I knew not everything, but I, I felt confident in, in in my knowledge base at that time, and I felt like I had you know, probably as good a grasp on, on that, on this type of information as anybody. I really did. Um, and boy, was I fucking wrong. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, I, uh, I fucking shot my complete and total load in the first month. Every fucking thing I knew. And then I was sitting there going, okay, well, what do I do now? What do I talk about? And, um, that's when I realized, cause at that point I, I had been holding back on the CMP stuff. I hadn't really started platforming on it yet. I really hadn't started railing on it a lot yet. I was still torn on it, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, here I was coming right out of the gates. Nobody knew who I was and I'm just, I'm going to come right out of the gates and I'm going to join this whatever it was or I, whatever I thought it was at the time, which, which was some kind of movement or something, you know, or some kind of uh, merging of like minds to try and move towards a common goal of exposing all this stuff. And, and um, you know, I just, I, I, I just, I thought it was, you know, the cause or whatever, but here I am and I'm fine. <laughs> I start finding all this CMP stuff and, and here's all these sacred cows and names that are familiar to me who have been on, on, sh on, you know, radio shows that I listen to, you know, and a lot of these guys are, are regular guests on Alex Jones show at the time. And I'm just sitting there going, my God, I'm going to come out of the fucking gates. Nobody knows me from Adam. I'm going to come out here and just fucking tell them it's all a lie. Are you serious? Because we all, you know, uh, most of us had just kind of realized that consensus reality was all a lie. Or, you know, some people, various, everybody, you know, comes to it different times. But a lot of people at that time hadn't really been aware of it for very long. <coughs> Including most of the people that were doing shows about it. Myself included. 
But you know, to to come out and be like, hey, look, you know, we woke up to consensus reality and now we're in this new paradigm. But what if that new paradigm is a lie, too, and all a part of this? Nobody wanted to hear that, man. It was already traumatic enough for people to have to accept the fact that the consensus reality that they believed, and it was still hard for people. It's still hard for people to accept the fact that <laughs> it becomes harder and harder. This is the real thing, the real takeaway for me, the real thing I've learned in the past 12 years is that the more you learn the more you begin to understand that it's not about finding out what we've been lied to about, which I think is what a lot of people, myself included, kind of thought this was all about in the beginning, right? The more you learn and the more you exist and live with this information and continue to expand what you know about it, you begin to understand that isn't about finding out what we've been lied to about and more about trying to find what we haven't been lied to about. And until you come to that realization, you are still at another of the, um, you know, the adept to medium adept level of understanding. And that's the, the, the stumbling block a lot of people can't get over. It's too much for them. They, they can't accept the fact. I mean, a lot of, everybody knows we've been lied to. I mean, even, even people who don't believe in conspiracies or any of that stuff know that, to a certain degree, we've been lied to about some things. But the degree, and that's the, that's the big thing. That's, I guess that's probably... I guess that's probably one of the, I don't know if it's, I would absolutely say it's the biggest, but one of the biggest takeaways for me, um, looking back, I look back on, on what I knew when I started the show 12 years ago today, which at the time I thought was a lot of info. And I look back now and see how much I've learned since then. And it's staggering. I would say I probably know, I don't even know if it's quantifiable. In my head, uh, now compared to then, it feels like what I know now compared to what I knew 12 years ago on this exact day, uh, it, it feels like it's enough to fill four brains is what it feels like. It feels like a 600% expansion in, in my hard drive storage. It, it, it's, it's very strange. It's almost, the only thing I can equate it to is like, you know, and I guess everybody does this, but it's kind of like when you look back on, on yourself, like what you knew in the third grade to what you knew, you know, what you know in your 20s or something. You know, you look back and you look back on yourself as a kid and stuff. But to me, it feels like the expanse of me now to me 12 years ago and who I am now compared to who I was then feels like a much larger expanse of time from now to when I was a kid. Does that make sense to you? You understand what I mean? Like, I feel like even though I was in my early 30s, 31 or something when I started this show. I'm 43 now. That's a lot of time, man. You know, uh, not a lot of people have been around as long as I have. That's just a fact. And that's, you know, that's a, that, that's a testament to me not giving up. And it's a testament to everyone out there who has supported my work during this time. And I appreciate every single one of you who have done this, have helped us get this far. Because it's a, it's a, uh, if it wasn't a worthy, journey i i would have quit doing this a long time ago i don't have to do that. i 
I don't have to do this, man. But it's a worthy journey. That's the thing. Um, would I rather go back to what I knew, to who I was and what I knew the day before I started this show? Fuck no. Hell no. Because I, I, to be honest with you, I would have never. No, I mean I, the continuation of this show and that idea of you know, okay, motherfucker, you know, now what are you going to do? You, you you shot your whole complete total wad in the first month. Now what are you going to do? Put me in a situation where I realized, oh, this is never going to end. But what I started to see in a really short amount of time, honestly, in in like six months, I I, I was taking quantum leaps all the time. I mean, I started out doing the show three days a week or four days a week or something for an hour, and quickly expanded into three and four hours, six days a week. Two, sh- I, I do five, I do Monday through Friday and do two shows on Saturday. I'm not fucking kidding you. I was a maniac. I was hopped up on uh, uh, what were those fucking uh, over the counter diet pills they used to sell? Uh, stacker Stacker Threes. Oh yeah, dude. Now I've never been a speed head or a meth head or or coke head or anything at all uh, like that psychedelics weed booze you know i was always i was into all those things but i was never into speeders and uppers but man i was working fucking oh and i was working at pizza hut too by the way did i mention that that's no bullshit i do five shows a week on friday a morning show on saturday a nighttime show on saturday and fucking go work like uh open to seven or eight at night at fucking pizza hut as a cook i did that for the first Two or three years I was on air, man, until I could get to the point where I got myself established, got to start my own, when I was on a bunch of different networks, and then started my own platform, and have been going ever since. The uh, Actually, December of this year, we'll have another anniversary to celebrate coming up in December, because in December will actually be uh, the 10-year anniversary of um, what I dubbed at the time the Global Reality Radio Network, which was essentially... Uh, my platform to broadcast the show because up until that time I had been on a bunch of other different platforms, a bunch of other different uh, uh, networks, some that I helped create and then left and then uh, went out on my own. And uh, so the first two years from 2007 until um, 2009 i was on a bunch of different networks and platforms and so for the past 10 years even though the show is 12 years old today for the past 10 years coming up in december uh this show has been an autonomous uh you know thing and it's been its own autonomous thing it hasn't been beholden to uh anyone else's platforms or networks or anything else it's it's, it's a huge um accomplishment especially for this you know um especially with with how much uh, the uh what's what i'm looking for how much they've tried to uh keep me suppressed you know i can't tell you how many times i've gone on some radio show and every single time i wait for it you know oh man how come we never heard about you before oh, i've been being suppressed man every time somebody finds me you know it's like well, when when i went on that british tv show how come we never heard of you before I mean, I, I haven't even talked about this. YouTube has, uh, YouTube froze my, about two weeks ago, YouTube froze my subscriber number. It had been going crazy for the past three months, going through the roof. Uh, they froze it at 17,400. It's been frozen there for the past two weeks. Not, not, not one single movement up or down. Uh, this coincided with some other chicanery I, I, I saw going on. Too, just like it did the first time it happened a few months ago. So, yeah, I mean, clearly, again, they're messing with shit. They're messing with, with, with my, because they got to mess with something. Because, uh, they've you know, obviously they've listened to my broadcast. And they know that YouTube is not, you know, YouTube is the end-all, be-all for a lot of people. It's never been the end-all, be-all for me. 
And I've, in fact, I've always been pissed off that I've been lumped into and called a YouTuber. I never considered myself a YouTuber because I started before it was around and it was never my, I've always had my, my show on independent platforms. And that's why I have the, uh, the Podbean, uh, members thing, you know, you get a membership for. That's really where the show is. I just happened to start posting some of the shows on the YouTube in 2015 just to try and get it out to some more people. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's the whole thing. But yeah, they're they're messing with my numbers. Yeah, I mean it's insane. We we <laughs> it, it just when you look at the numbers, it, it just never makes sense. How are you going to have seven? How are you gonna have uh, uh, we just cracked uh, seven million not long ago. Seven million lifetime views for all my videos. Seven million. 7 million views, but only 17,000 subscribers. Yeah, those, those numbers don't add up. Same thing with the Gold Reality Facebook page. Even though I get notifications every day about people who, new people who are like, who have liked the page, it, it's been the count for the view count on the page has been at right at, right at or under 2,000 for about. When was the last time I was on Coast to Coast AM? 2014? Five years? Yeah, about that long. My subscriber count on the Global Reality Radio Network Facebook page. I mean, think about that. Nobody's numbers stay that stagnant that long, especially when you're seeing, getting notifications saying, you know, such and such liked your page. In fact, if I even go look at the likes, you can, I can go through there and see all these recent people who have liked the page. Yet, when I go look at my numbers, it says 1,991 likes and 2000, 2,008 follows. And that's where it's been for about the past five years. The number has never gone up or down in the analytics from around that number, even though consistently I get notifications about people who have recently liked the page. You see what I'm saying? So that's, just, that's not just one example. That's two examples. Uh, I've almost thought about nuking all my shit and starting over from scratch with a new page. Um, you know, with stuff just to see if, if something changed. I don't know. I don't know if that would help or not. But uh, it's, yeah, I, I, I would never have come as far with this research and my, on my own knowledge base. I would never have come this far. Without this show, and without uh, you know the constantly, because once I decided to, uh, it's just constantly staying on it. And once I decided to dedicate myself to this, because it didn't, it you know, it wasn't that way at first, really. You know, it didn't start out as. I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to dedicate my life to this. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It didn't, it didn't, uh, that, you know, that was never in my mind starting out. But I can, I mean, just the things that, uh, that occurred and, and happened in the first two or three years I was doing the show, it was astounding. And I'd interviewed some, you know, big names and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, the CMP research and, and coming out with the first film ever made on the Council of National Policy. I'm really proud of the stuff I've done with the films and also proud of the things that, that uh, are coming out that I've done. And that's also why, uh, as I've stated previously, I'm going to do Silk Asters 2, 3, and then I'm going to do, uh, you know, may, may possibly be called the spell, uh, the uh, Secret Right Volume Three. I haven't really decided yet, but tentatively, you know, that's basically what you can assume it's going to be. But it's all with all the uh, that I'm doing with uh, the help of John Brisson, and we're going to be uh, collaborating on that. Uh, so he's helped me extensively with the research, uh, just so much I wouldn't, I would, you know, would never have been able to. Uh, 
do that amount of research in a short amount of time without his help. Uh, and it's a great two way street. You know, I find something he, he hasn't found and he finds something I haven't found. You know, that's the way it's supposed to be, man. That's, uh, I don't know what the fuck is so hard about that. You know, some people just don't fucking get it, but that's exactly why I don't fucking like working with anybody. Cause nobody fucking, I don't, I don't know what the fuck is so hard about that. What the fuck is so hard about, I'm doing my own research. You're doing your own research. I hit you with something. You hit me with something. The research gets expanded. We do something with it. We put it out there. We move on. We do it again. What the fuck is so hard about that? Why why are people such fucking dumbasses? I don't get it. That's why I fucking don't work with anybody usually. Because just do the fucking work and that's all you got to fucking do. You know? And we'll fucking high five and fucking, you know, whatever, crack fucking crack a fucking beer after the work gets done. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. So some people, I think they, 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 they fucking think they're going to get be buddies with you or something. And when, the, when they fucking realize, oh, wait, he's serious about this. You know, they don't, they, so I, what I'm saying is, yeah, I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate john's help and i appreciate where we're going with this research but i think after those those three films are done, I think i'm done with films after that as far as the conspiracy films go i want to do other types of films do some other stuff but uh other types of documentaries as well music stuff and whatever else i don't know who, who knows do who knows what i'll do but um oh there also still may be I keep saying that maybe the last one, but no, there's still going to be uh, Lost Secrets. I keep forgetting about Lost Secrets, Ancient America, Volume 3. At some point, that'll get done. Then that'll be it. So I got four. What am I talking about? Never mind. I'll be here making films for the foreseeable future. I might as well just say that because, you know, we'll have uh, two of those out this year. And then probably one or two out next year. So yeah, I'll be making films at least till 2021. What the fuck am I saying? It's like Tarantino. It's like Tarantino. Oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm making three more movies, and they're like, well, you put out a fucking one movie every five years, dude. So you're retiring in 15 years. Great. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for that. Uh, I you know sometimes you you think out loud. You know that's really all I was doing with that. But um, my point is is that, you know, I, I, I can put a fucking pin in it and say, okay, I don't want to do them past this, but, you know, if, if I think we, whenever, I'm not going to ever, ever discount any, any film that I might make any film on any subject because of what I just talked about earlier with how much I've grown and learned in the time in which I've been on air doing the show. There's still more things to learn. You think just because my fucking hard drive has increased 600 or 800 times, whatever the fuck I said earlier, the time which I've done this show, that that's it? Fuck no. But a lot of people, it's that way. It's not, it's not that way for me. This is not like, you know, I've never approached this like, like it's school or something. Like we get to a certain point and then we're done. And then after that, you become an expert. And that's what a lot of people try and do. And uh, a lot of these people haven't even been oh, not fucking toenails that are older than the length of time that people fucking some of these people that are so-called experts now, you know, the ones they bring on these TV shows or whatnot. So. I'm not going to ever discount that I make a, might make a film about anything, because I think that just like the CMP stuff, you know, you got to remember, there's a point where I knew nothing about that information. Just like the rock wall stuff, I made the first film of the CMP, I made the first film of the rock wall. You know, there was a point where I didn't know anything about either one of those things. And then what I've done with the first spellcasters and what I've exposed there and the connection with Scientology and, and the truth movement, and how it connects to the CMP stuff. And now we're learning how much even more larger those things even connect to that we'll be revealing in future films. So I, I'm, you know, I'm never going to say. My desire is is that once I get done with these four things I've got on my plate, 
my desire is that I don't do anything else in that field or plan to do anything else in that field on film uh, as far as documentaries go for a while. But with that said, I'm never going to say, because if I find out about, about something that I don't know about and I start uncovering some new fucking, which, <laughs> you know, you think how many times can it happen in one lifetime? I tell you, I thought that 10 years ago. Not kidding you. I really did. I mean, after, after I started uncovering the CMP stuff, I was like, well, where else can you, you know, where, where, where else is there to go? Uh, so there's always new places to go. Even though you don't see them right now, and even though they're not, you know, you're not aware of them, they're out there. And you can bet your ass, if anybody's going to find them, it's going to be me. The universe is going to present them to me. It always has. I, I just, the, the crazy synchronicities, the crazy <coughs> just reaffirming things that have happened again and again as a course of doing this work, man. It's probably the only thing that, uh, you know, gets you through the tough times, like people not supporting your work. I mean, listen. And at this point, if anybody deserves to be supported, it's me, guys. I'm a fucking soldier. I've never quit. I've been on. I've been on the front lines over for decades, and I don't want anything more than to be able to be able to keep doing this and have the the the, the cash to stay alive, to keep the lights on, and to keep making films and doing shows and stuff. That's it, man. I don't want you know. I'm not after fucking. You see that ridiculous desk Alex Jones has with like the fucking screens on the front. I mean, give me a break. A fucking break, man. Has that shit made Alex Jones a better researcher? Absolutely not. Would it make me a better researcher? Absolutely not. Because, but at the same time, I'm going to do what I do wherever I do it. I would do the same. If if I was, what I'm doing right now, I could do anywhere as long as I have a place to do it, you know. But this idea that you've got nothing left to learn. I mean, listen, a lot of you out there, too, need to take, a lot of you listeners, too. I've seen you guys comments. Hey, just because you guys, let, let me tell you something. In case a lot of you don't know this. Let me tell you something. Just because these, these monkeys ain't on, on air doesn't mean that they aren't more egotistical than me or other people that are, are doing shows. I, I, I just, there are people, I, I see comments from them all the time. Some of you out there, man, y'all need some humility. You need to let that ego go. Somebody ought to accept the fact that you don't know everything. Jesus Christ, if I can do it. I mean, I see people out there. I, I, I guarantee I know 100,000 times more than they'll ever know in their fucking life. Yet they walk around acting like they know everything and they don't know shit. It's funny how I see, you see that. These, these people listen to these shows like, God damn, so many experts. Jesus Christ, if I purported to know as much as you purport to know, I'd have been fucking, I'd been begging for a microphone and a fucking show to do it on when I was 10. It's hilarious. <laughs> but it's, you know, listen, it's been a journey and, uh, and the journey's just begun. It's going to continue. Here we are 12, in our 12, it's 12 years. I can't believe it. It's, uh, there's been three presidents since this show has been on air. How crazy is that? Bush was still in office when this started. I've been, I'll start using that when I, when I get older. I've been on air. I've been on air since the Bush era, motherfucker. Fuck off. <laughs> No, but I love you guys. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, take some time out and reflect. 
I don't like to do it very often, but special occasions like this, I think it's good to reflect and look back. I like to, you know, and to do it openly and talk to you about it. And because that's how you learn, you know, that's how I learn. That's how you learn. You think I don't learn something from for talking about this stuff and, and, and talking about it out loud and talking about it. I do. I absolutely do. If I didn't, I wouldn't still do this. That's the great thing about it. It's uh, doing a show and, and it, it doesn't give you, when you're doing this kind of stuff, when you're doing, I guess you could, but it, does, it never has for me. Um, you know, I can forget to fucking take the, put the trash cans out to the curb one week, you know. We all do it, right? You forget sometimes. You can forget fucking what day it is, man. You think it's fucking Wednesday and it's fucking Thursday or something. It happens to the best of us. You know, or, you know, you for whatever it might be, you forgot to take the fucking track, whatever, you know, it's, it's, this, uh, does, doing this kind of thing, does he ever give you the opportunity to have, to, to have those things like that? You know, you gotta, it forces you to stay on your game 24 seven. And, um, that's how the, doing the, reading the books on air came about. It's crazy. Cause when I did that at the time, nobody else had done that. That's something I, that I don't think I get enough credit for. That uh, there was before I did the, started reading books on air, and the first book I ever read on air was the uh, Finding of the Third Eye, and I did two readings of that as well. You can get all the audiobooks in the uh, download shop. We've got one package in there. It's got every one of them. You should get that. You can also get that if you buy the the box set too, the the download collection box set, which has everything in the uh, download shops on sale this week. In honor of the 12 year anniversary for only 120 bucks. It's going back up to 175 next week and it'll never be that low again. So you might want to get one of those this week while you can. I, uh, nobody had, nobody had done that. And I only did that because it was right around, uh, the, the first, the 2008 elections, right around the first, uh, uh Obama administration towards the end of the Bush era, which, of course, is, like I said, when the show started. But as you guys know, as you've seen, and as I've experienced, uh, what, three, four times now, three times since I've been doing this show, you know, the news cycles, just you think they're shit now. Um, I'll take what we get when there's no elections going on over any other time, it just, it sucks because all the fucking news on every website is all revolved around the re-elections and it becomes very difficult to find material to talk about that isn't uh, related to that and I started seeing that it was by design that they did that. And so I wasn't going to participate in that. So that's when I said, well, you know, I had to, at that point, I think I was doing four hours a day. <laughs> I was trying to compete with Jones. Because when I first started, I said, you know what? I even liked Jones at this time. I, I, I still liked him when I made this statement. But when I first started, I said, you know what? Give me a year. Give me a year of doing this show. And I'll be going up against Alex Jones, toe-to-toe against him in his own time slot in a year. And I did it in six months. Not only did I do it, I did it in six months. Within six months of starting the show, I was doing my show 11 to 3 or whatever. He, he, he was doing three hours. He bumped it up to four. I bumped mine up to four. Fuck him. I was coming for him. I was coming for him. And not only was I coming for him, I was coming for him at the same time that he was on air. And if he would have, you know, some CMP guest on, I'd be over there exposing whoever he was having on live at the same time. <laughs> oh, it was eating his ass, dude, because people were calling in. There was one time I've got some of these recordings somewhere. I've got to find them. I've got them on hard drives, but I've got some recordings from Jones's show. We had a, a, a campaign. This is, 
I, I, I really am glad I remembered this. I kind of wanted to do that tonight to go through some of my favorite moments uh, during the, the course of the show. Um, and this is one of my favorites. This is around when uh, the the Secret Volume One came out, two thousand nine, and um, nobody really paid attention. That was the, you know that was the greatest thing for me about uh, that film, The Secret Volume One. Even though you know, I mean, listen, it's crappy. The first two films I was working with crappy computers and crappy software. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, but I had this info, you know. So I tried to do whatever I could with it. And I also intentionally did not mention or connect Alex Jones to the CMP in volume one. And that was, that was calculated. I did that on purpose because I wanted people to come to their own conclusion about it. You know, I showed you Jack McClam and I showed you, you know, all those guys, Corsi and talked about them being the CMP and then, and, and, but didn't mention Jones. And uh, a lot of people didn't like that. But I wanted people to draw their own conclusions because I knew that if I just came right out of the gates, especially at that time in that climate where nobody wanted to hear anything negative about Alex Jones, it would, uh, you know, people would have just focused on that and just called me a hater or whatever. So that's why I made the decision just to make the Secret Right Volume 1 not have Jones mentioned in it. That was a very, it was calculated, it was 100%. I'm not going to even mention him at all. I'm just going to show the periphery stuff. And if people are smart, and not everybody is, but a lot of people are, if the right people see this movie, maybe it's t- you know maybe it's ten years from now, maybe it's a year from now, whenever they're going to understand what I'm. They're going to understand this. They're going to go, oh, and that's what happened. And so right right after uh, the Secret Right Volume One came out, people started. Uh, firebombing Jones's fucking uh, uh, call-ins on his show asking about, and I didn't even tell people to do this. This was all spontaneous from people who watched that film. I didn't order people or give people directions to call into Jones' show and ask him if he uh, if he's a member of the Council for National Policy. Because again, I didn't even mention Jones's name. People called into his show, not not just to say like, hey, uh, hey, Alex, what, what, what do you know about the CMP, the Council for National Policy? And you see what he'd say. No, every single one of these callers was calling in and saying, you know, Jones, you know, piece of shit. What, <laughs> you know, you're in CMP. You're in the CMP, Jones. You need to answer for this and shit. Fox, I don't know what's going on. But, uh, uh, God, we got all these people calling in here today and uh, they're all angry and uh, ask me if I'm I'm in the, the CMP or something like that. I I don't, folks, I, I, I've never heard of this group. You know, I, I don't even think about it. You could tell he was obviously, obviously shook. He was shook. And then later he came back and said some other shit. And, well, folks, you know, they, they, they work for the Hunt family. And uh, the Hunt family were fighting the New World Order. So I don't know what's so bad about them. The Hunt family was fighting the New World Order, huh? That's what I was like. Okay. All right. All bets are off on this clown. I mean, I would already at that point knew what I was dealing with. But the way he got all shook and scared by the college and then changed his tune and then later did shows on it. He later did shows on it and brought on, uh, I've got this recording somewhere. I'm not kidding. You. He brought on uh, Phil Schlafly and did a whole fucking shill cover up on the CMP. That was all caused by me and my and, and my followers, my supporters, the people who saw this, all that. And it's documented. It tells you you can go hear these shows. Jones never addressed the CMP before, and then he went from saying he didn't know anything about it to saying, "Well, folks, it, 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 you know, it, we, we have it just you know they were they were trying to help out Reagan. You know, that was the same fucking yarn that Paul Craig Roberts, fuck, aka Pruneface from Dick Tracy." That was the same yarn he fucking spun when I went after his ass when he was on a show. First, he said he didn't know anything, never heard of the group. Didn't know who they were. Then I said, well, you were, you were a member. No, I wasn't a member. 
You just said they were secret. You said they don't make their membership list public. So how could you know I'm a member? I said, sir, I didn't say that. They don't make all of their membership list public, but we do have some. And uh, and you appear on them. Well, I was, that was just for a short time in the 80s, and it was a support group for Reagan. No, wait a minute. A minute ago, you said you didn't know anything about this group. You never heard of it before. Now you're saying, not only have you heard of them, but you were a member for a short time in the 80s. Correct? Yeah, a short time in the 80s, support group for Reagan. Uh, sir, um, that's another lie. What do you mean that's another lie? That's another, you're calling me a liar. I'm Paul Kirk Roberts. I'm the father of Reaganomics. You're also a fucking liar. Because we got membership. List. I thought you said they made their membership less secret. They, sir, again, they do make some of them secret, but some of them are available. And guess what, buddy? You're on there as late as 1999 as being a member. What do you got to say about that? Well, I think, listen, y'all don't think I'm bad now, do you? I mean, he was shit. <laughs> oh, my God, man. Old prune face. I'll never forget when he put Alex in check one time. Alex was like talking over him. And I uh, wouldn't let him finish. And, uh, and he goes, God damn it, Alex, let me finish. And they like came back from the break. And Alex didn't even say like, welcome back. We're here with our guest, Paul Craig Roberts. Folks, we're back here with uh, Volker Grower. No, they didn't even do that. They came back and the music played and Jones did, was sat there silent. And then it came back and uh, Paul Craig Roberts started talking and he was like, then later he was like, I'm not going to, every time I, uh, uh, he, he, he's going to bite my head off again, folks. Oh, yeah. I, that was when I was like, oh, I see. I see what's going on here. Because I already knew Paul Craig Roberts was a, you know, CIA spook. And it was starting to assume Jones was too. But then when I saw that, you know, that sort of, what do you call that? The, the slapping down, you know, like slapping down an underling. To see somebody like, you know, because you could tell in the tone of his voice that he took, it, it wasn't just like, you could tell he knew Alex in a per, more personal manner than we're aware of. You understand what I mean? I, I, it's the only way I can describe it. You just to the tone and his it was a very stern and a familiar stern. Which you know what I mean, like the way your dad would talk to you. You know, if you're fucking up or your grandpa or something. Boy, don't make me knock the shit out of you. You know that kind of voice. Boy, I'll slap your ass right here in front of your mom. I don't give a fuck. I'll fucking like. Yeah, that's the way Paul Craig Roberts hit fucking Jones with that, and Jones snapped. You better believe, buddy. He snapped. He he showed showed him respect after that. So that was a that was that you know that was a big moment. But it, it, that was that was a great moment. And then you know just just the fact that our listeners caused that to happen in that film. I mean, he was getting hit, and he started employing uh, right around that time on his YouTube channel. This is you got to remember this is two thousand nine. This is ten years ago. It's how long I've been kicking that dude's dick in the dirt. He ought, he ought to have me on just cuz at this point. You understand? You know what I mean? I don't hate you, Alex. I really don't. I, I, I wish the best for you, sir, as I do any anybody. But, you know, if you're working for the other side, that's my job to expose you. It's nothing personal, bud. Never has been. I don't hate Alex Jones. Uh, it's not about that. But, uh, again, you know, if he's going to purport to be one thing and be another, i got to expose that. But yeah, he ought to, yeah, that motherfucker ought to just have me on this at this point. Just cuz. Come on, Jones. I've been kicking your dick in the dirt for 12 years. Yeah, yeah, it has some mad respect just for that. Yeah, throw me, throw me a few of them, them, uh, them, them fucking CMP shekels you got over there. I'll throw some in the kitty for us. Just cuz. Who's been kicking, who's, doing, who's been, who's been doing you better than me for the past 12 years, son? Come on, give it up. Nobody. When I make, when I make you my project, I don't go. Half ass. You got to at least give me that, Jones, even if you don't like me. Uh, maybe I'll run into him. Maybe we'll get a table. I want to get a table at that Flat Earth Conference. You, you guys see who their, who their keynote speaker is going to be at that? Owen Benjamin. <laughs> oh, goddamn. 
Joey Diaz fucked that motherfucker up for life. I'm not kidding you. It's a true story. Joey Diaz gave, this is live on air, gave Owen Benjamin a 1,000 milligram THC star, death star, star of death. And he, and he didn't even give it to him. He just like, they were just sitting there and, and he just grabbed one. And he was like, oh shit. Dude, he like, in the middle, you can go watch the show and like, look up Joey Diaz, Owen Benjamin. Then go look at the dates. I'm not fucking kidding. This is a fucking true story. I was telling my friend about this tonight. He was like, no fucking way. I'm like, this is goddamn truth. I'm not fucking kidding you. This is the truth. Joey Diaz gave him a thousand milligram fucking edible and he fucking flipped out and got up and left in the middle of a live podcast and Joey never saw him again. He had a fucking total fucking flip out mental breakdown from the pure overwhelming power of a thousand milligrams in a THC edible that he consumed. He flipped out. He claimed that Joe Rogan and Joey Diaz tried to poison him with THC. Now that alone is just hilarious. Po uh, just slow that down again. Poison him with THC. <laughs> that alone shows you how bad shit he is. Uh, but this, he took it a step further. He claims that Joey Diaz and uh, Joe Rogan tried to poison him with THC because he's a Trump supporter. You know what he did after that fucking thousand milligram star of death? Flipped out, mental breakdown. Left Hollywood. Moved to the woods with a bunch of guns and became a flat earther uh, alt-right guy. And this flat earth conference they're having in Dallas in November, he's like their fucking keynote speaker. I'm not fucking kidding you. I went and looked at the website last night. He's like a keynote speaker and they're having like a separate comedy thing with him too. I was just like, oh my fucking God, it doesn't get any better than that. Holy shit, that's fucking hilarious. Oh my God. That's just the funniest shit I ever heard of. They tried to poison me with THC. Dude, if it was possible to be poisoned or to poison someone with THC, There'd be motherfuckers lining up going, dude, poison me. Poison me now. Shoot in my veins. <laughs> yeah, what a dumbass. I just saw, I was like, man, I got you. Know, I got to get a table this thing. I need you guys help for that. We got to get, I got to get a table with that thing. I got to go represent. I got to go broadcast and, and shoot some footage. And, I mean, especially, if, dude, if Jones is going to show up, it's a flat earth thing, and Owen Benjamin is going to be there, do you, brother, I got to represent this issue. I got to go see this shit show. I got to go document it, do some broadcast from it. Oh my fucking God. That's going to be legendary. Are you kidding me? That's like fucking, that's like the battle Royale, dude. You know, you have any idea what kind of dumb ass he's going to be going on at this fucking thing. I got to go, dude. And I don't just got to go. Fuck that. I don't want to attend. I want to have a table there. I want to sell my shit. I want to do some live broadcasts. And uh, it's in video shit and put it out and see. Oh, my God. It's, it's going to be pure fucking gold. Are you kidding me? Broadcast live from the Flat Earth Conference. We'll, we'll see if fucking that Jones may show up to. He's saying he, I don't know, saying he might show up. But either way, they got, I just think it's hilarious. <laughs> oh, they fucking do I actually, uh. I meant to talk about this the other night. I actually, speaking of Joey Diaz, I actually got to meet Joey Diaz a couple of weeks ago. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, he came to Dallas and did stand-up comedy. And uh, and then uh, after the show, met everybody. So, yeah, he was, he was a really nice guy. I'd say he was really cool. Uh, his, his, his energy is nothing like what his persona puts out. He's really, uh, man, the guy's really just a big teddy bear. And, uh, you know, he, he treats everybody like their family. You know, wants to know your name, you know, how long you've been a fan and stuff. Really cool guy, really nice. And uh, it was a nice thing that happened for me while I was displaced from uh, from my studio. Another awesome, amazing thing that happened. Last weekend, uh, my friend was like, hey, man, uh, I got this extra ticket. 
do you want to go to this concert? Now, before I tell you who it was, you know, free ticket and concert, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you hear those two words. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say no to that. I mean, it, I mean, unless it's like, you know, hey, man, I got tickets to go see fucking Milli Vanilli. You down? Nah, dog. <laughs> nah, I'm cool. Hey, we're going to see fucking Vanilla Ice, New Kids on the Block, and Backstreet Boys in one show. You want to go? Nah, I'm cool. It's free. And yeah, still. There might be some bitches there. All right. What time are you picking me up? No. <laughs> uh, a few months ago, I talked about it's crazy. I've talked about this before too. You never know what you never know what you're gonna say. It's gonna be people's fucking hot button thing. You know what I mean? Uh, oftentimes it's like that. I'll say something that I think is just insignificant, and that's the trigger that sets people off. And one thing I, I mentioned a few months ago, and I don't remember what subject I was talking about, but uh, I mentioned that I, I, you know, just never listen. You can't like everything. I, you know, there's. That's why it's great that there's so many bands and different types of music out there because everybody can like different things, you know. So I think I mentioned something about not being a big Iron Maiden fan on the show. And, you know, I, I should have added to that. The thing about Iron Maiden is, is that the perception is, is that you either don't like them or you are absolutely a fucking culty of them. And when I tell people that I'm not either one of those. It just becomes, well, then you're not a fan. Listen, just because I don't know all the fucking B-sides and every fucking song and, I, you know, have ne wouldn't, never went out and bought their records, even though I've listened to their records. I have never went out and bought copies of them myself. You know, hey. They don't have to be one of my favorite bands for of all time for me to respect them. But anyway. I took a lot of shit for that. Man, motherfuckers are, god damn, y'all are pissed. Like, god damn, I, I could sit up here and talk about how a big foreigner sucks a dick and never get any grief, which is good, because they do, and if you did give me any grief, I would have to tell you to fuck off, because you're an idiot, and you fucking don't know what's good. But, uh, <laughs> that's beside the point. Um, oh, people were pissed, and I had to say, I look, listen, listen, I like the first record with the first singer, I like the second album with, with Paul Diano. Uh, the first, the first two Maiden records, I think are fantastic. I'm just not a big fan of Bruce Dickinson, but Hey, friend of mine, you want to go see Maiden tonight? Fuck. Yes. I want to go see Maiden tonight. And this was the, uh, it's called the, uh, legacy of the beast tour. Cause Maiden does this thing where they tour, they do like a, every other tour thing where like, if they put out a new record, they tour a new record. They play the majority, if not the entire album live and then throw in like two or three classics and then the the next tour will be a greatest hits tour where they'll do all the hits and all the fucking so this was this happened to fall on one of those uh legacy of the beast so it's a greatest hits um set list and um you know i gotta say you know i've seen listen i mean i've seen everybody everybody it's been possible for me to see since about 1990 or so I've seen. And uh, I, but I've never seen Iron Maiden. I just never, I never had a chance to really. I never remember, nobody, I never had anybody, none of my friends ever knew New Hey, you want to go see Iron Maiden? I never knew anybody that said that. I never recall seeing tickets for sale. I mean, obviously I know they played in Dallas many times through the years, but uh, it was probably, you know, I was probably going to see Rush or something. You know, if Rush and Iron Man are playing on the same night, I can tell you I'm going to go see 100% of the time. So it may have been a situation like that. But anyway, so, uh, so I went to see Iron Maiden. Iron fucking Maiden. And uh, like I said, I've never owned one of their albums. I've downloaded some of their albums probably a long time ago. But or, or listened to them with friends. or friends had them. I've never bought one of the records. I don't have any of them on vinyl. Um, I like I said. I like the first two records the best when they had before Bruce in the pre Bruce Dickinson era. But guess what? I knew every single song they played. 
every single song they played. I knew, how is that? That's how iconic Iron Maiden is. I've only seen a very few acts in my entire life like that, and another I'll tell you about another one of them in just a second. That's how iconic Iron Maiden is, ladies and gentlemen. And yes, my opinion of the band, and I've heard that, you know, they're just one of those bands where Rush is the same way. Uh, Iron Maiden really I see the conne- I see the connection, I see the um especially with the fan base and everything now. I see the association with Rush and uh, Iron Maiden now that I didn't see before. Because they are like Rush where, you know, you can, you know, I've, like I said, I've always uh, respected Iron Maiden. I've never shit talked to them and hated on them. But they just never, you know, they weren't somebody I was constantly rocking. And, you know, I've never really big, been a real big fan of Bruce Dickinson's voice. I'm not going to lie, I'm still not. Uh, but this concert was incredible. It was incredible. And we didn't even hear, have good seats. You know, we're out on the fucking lawn on the grass. And it was incredible. You know, like a full size one of those P fifty eight Mustang airplanes, like r- full size, real deal. Eddie came out. Listen to this set list. I mean, I, this again. But my point is, they're so iconic. I knew every single song. I knew every fucking single song they did, and that's when it hit me. That's when it hit me. Like, God damn, that's why they're Iron Maiden. That's why the fuck they're Iron Maiden. Because how can somebody like me, who's never bought one of their records, this, it's not like they were getting played on the radio. It's not like they ever did or or even do now. I knew every every song was a classic. Ace is high. This is a set list. Ace is high. Where Eagles Dare. Two Minutes to Midnight. The Klansman. The Trooper. Revelations. For the Greater Good of God. The Wicker Man. Sign of the Cross. Flight of Icarus. Fear of the Dark. Number of the Beast. Iron Maiden. Encore. The Evil That Men Do. Hallowed Be That Name. Run to the Hills. Jesus, did they fuck it? And they had Pyro. They had Eddie came out. It was, it was amazing. It was great. Uh, so to all of you out there who hated on me when I said I wasn't a big Iron Maiden fan, that's for you. I want to give you my full report. And uh, man, great show! If you get a chance to see this tour, they're out on. Don't miss the chance of this. These guys are like, well, they're got to be. In, they're not in their seventies. They're pushing seventy. I got at least seventy, right? They sound fantastic. The sound system is amazing. We were out on the lawn, and, um, you know, usually the experience out there is not that great, but they got like had upgraded screens at this venue and had more speakers. It was, it was phenomenal. Um, it really was. Yeah, it was a fantastic show. So I wanted to put that out there and, uh, and give you that because I did. Maiden fans are nuts. But I do, I do really see the association between, uh, you know, Rush fans and Iron Maiden fans now, as far as the, as far as the fan base goes. There's dudes out there like grilling in the parking lot, like the show was like already was about to start. I was like, look at these fucking guys. These guys have been out here since fucking two o'clock this afternoon, and fucking listening to the Trooper on Infinite Repeat. Like the show was starting, these guys like still had like some shit on the grill and the barbecue. They were like barbecuing some shit, dude. They and I like walked by and I, <laughs> I told my friend, I was like, "Nah, man, I'm not. I'm not going going in until like at least song three, dude." These guys are out there. They, they were probably, they looked they were fucking drunk and baked and they were fucking grilling some shit. Like these, this is what you want to see. They had like fucking deadheads. You know what I'm saying? Them Iron Maiden fucking fans go hard, dude. And an opening act? Nah. Nah, Iron Maiden fans aren't doing an opening act. You could be Metallica. You could be fucking who? You could be Elvis. You could bring John Lennon and fucking George Harrison back from the dead and have have them go out and open for Iron Maiden and people would uh, stay out in the parking lot and drink beers till b- about 10 minutes before Maiden went on. Not even kidding you. It didn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you got. They don't want it. They want Maiden. Doesn't give a fuck. Oh, you're great? We don't care. Maiden. Next. Hey, we've got uh, back from the grave for, for a super group. It's Tom Petty, George Harrison, Prince, and George Michael, P- 
pass. Pass. Nah, we don't care. Maiden, next. <laughs> they don't care. And uh, it was hilarious, too, because there was a whole lot. And I mean a whole lot. Probably more than I've ever seen at any metal show I've ever been to. There was a extremely large amount of marijuana smoking going on. It, it, it to the point to where Bruce Dickinson throughout the show was throwing tantrum fits. I'm not kidding you. He, you know, he does his scream for me, you know, thing that he does and shit. Scream for me, Dallas. Uh, and people were just, I mean, because they were, there was an opener. We already discussed that. How Maiden fans feel about openers. There was an opener, which I couldn't even tell you who they were. Uh, and then it took them about 25 or 30 minutes later than they were expected to come on stage. Come on stage. So they came on stage late. So by the time they hit the stage, people were hot. You know, it's Texas. It's summertime. We're, you know, we're telling something. Hey, it's still hot. People been out there. It's an opener. People are drunk. People are baked. And Bruce Dickinson was pissed. I mean, you could, I mean, it was, you could see the clouds over this fucking venue. It's one of those outdoor amphitheater types with the lawn, you know. And, uh, <laughs> There's three or four times where he was throwing fits because people were just meh, meh. <laughs> you can I can see the seas of people like out you know normally you see like a mosh pit area and, you know people are standing up and bouncing no dude everybody was sitting down and Bruce Dickinson even at one point during the show goes you know uh you people seem to have a lot less energy now. Since a certain substance is pretty much legal. So come on, you fuckers. Let's rock and roll. Let's go. Scream for me, Dallas. Oh, dude, it was hilarious. He was getting so pissed. It was like four or five times, and they just gave up. It was like four or five times where he was like throwing little conniptions like, <laughs> well, dude, yeah, you're late coming on. People are fucking baked and drunk. It's Saturday night. What do you expect? You're not going to get, you know, that three o'clock in the afternoon at a festival in Europe crowd at 1030 at night on a Saturday in Dallas, Texas. Give me a break, son. He was pissed, though. And yes, he wasn't. Not, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't off the mark in that statement, dude. That crowd was spit roasted. Oh, my God. It was ridiculous. I mean, you couldn't walk two feet. I ain't mad at it. I'm just saying. You couldn't walk two feet. It was smogged out in Dallas, and Bruce Dickinson was having done. The rest of the guys looked like they were just having fun, and uh, they sounded great. And it, it was, it, you know, the, the sound system was really incredible. I just uh, the clarity that it got, even way far back, was pretty staggering. <laughs> I just had to laugh at that. I just started thinking about it. It was even funnier afterwards. Cause he just went, and then he did this weird, like, I don't know. It's like 15 minute rant where he was just ranting, yelling at the audience. And people were getting pissed, throwing shit. Yeah, that was great. So yeah, scratch that one off my bucket list. Cause I've seen everybody else, man. I've seen fucking Judas priest. I've seen Metallica a bunch of times. I saw Megadeth a shit ton of times. I saw fucking Anthrax a shit ton of times. I've seen Testament a shit ton of times. I've seen fucking, you know, on and on and on. I've seen Sabbath. I've seen Ozzy. I've seen fucking pretty much everybody I ever wanted to see that was alive for me to be able to say, I saw fucking Pink Floyd in 94 at fucking Texas Stadium on the Division Bell Tour when I was 18, motherfucker. What? Back then, a lot of people weren't into Pink Floyd, man. Pink Floyd kind of had a renaissance with younger people a few years after that. But I mean, I can remember people calling me an idiot. I was 18, I worked at a record store, and it was like the most expensive ticket that it had ever been. I think the first couple of times I saw Rush, it was 15 bucks, 20 bucks. 
and that was a lot, you know, at the time. I think Counterparts Tour in 93 was 25, and it was like, oh, my God, 25. And then the next year, Pink Floyd comes to Texas Stadium, and it's 50. You thought 25 was a lot for Rush last year. Pink Floyd just came to Texas Stadium. They're 50 bucks. Now 50 is like, she, the I think lawn, I think those lawn seats for, for Maiden were, in Dallas were 60 alone. The lawn tickets, those are usually like 15, 20 bucks. Maiden, they were 60. That I didn't have to pay for that shit. Uh, no, it was great. I'm so appreciative of my friend. Honestly, I don't want to sound uh, ungrateful there. I it, knowing what I know now, yeah, I would pay the sixty now for sure. Oh yeah, after seeing it once, yeah, I probably wouldn't. I wouldn't have before. Uh, but uh, oh, I'd gladly fork, fork over sixty bucks for that show. Now, yeah, it was great. It was phenomenal. But. Uh, yeah, I'll never forget that. 50 bucks. I remember people saying I was an idiot. Oh, I can't believe you'd spend the much. Oh, you're an idiot. And then how many times did Pink Floyd tour again after that? Mm, let's see. Uh, exactly zero? Hmm. I always pissed me off when, I, when like Roger Waters comes to town, right? And I'll hear motherfuckers go, oh, we're going to Pink Floyd Friday night. I'm, no, you're not. Yeah, we are. We got tickets. You're not going to see Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd's not touring. You're going to see Roger Waters. Well, yeah. That's not Pink Floyd, dude. Call it what it is. I saw Pink Floyd. Okay? And I don't give a fuck of that fuck stick. I'm glad that fuck stick Roger Waters wasn't there. Ben's much better without that guy. Yeah, I said it. I'll get hate for that, too. Ah, I don't, I'm not a Roger Waters fan. I don't like his voice. It's gravelly. I don't like... I, I, Listen, I mean, he did some great stuff in Pink Floyd. I don't, I don't want to discount that. He did some garbage, too. Let's be fair. Everybody's got stinkers. And everybody's got stinkers. I don't care who it is. I've talked about this before. It's the truth. Everybody's got stinkers. The greatest, whoever you consider to be in your subjective opinion, to be the greatest of whatever of all time music, they got stinkers in their collection. Every one of them. The cute girl that, you, you're into to you're afraid to go talk to that plays acoustic at Friday night at the coffee bar plays all those great songs you love guess what stinkers she's got stinkers too stinkers everybody linen linen stinkers plenty of stinkers plenty of stinkers Bob Dylan who plenty of stinkers plenty of them the bands I like Queen oh plenty of stinkers plenty of stinkers the Beatles plenty of stinkers Led Zeppelin, plenty of stinkers. Rush, plenty of stinkers. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who it is. Name a band, plenty of stinkers. Everybody's got stinkers. Can't be afraid of the stinkers, man. Everybody's got them. It happens. It's just part of, you know, it's part of the game. You're going to get some winners. You're going to have some losers. It's the way it is. The way she goes, boys. But uh, anyway, I don't even know where I was going with that. <laughs> kind of uh, lost my train of thought there for a second. Anyway, I don't know what I was I was going through, but I was talking about the shows and concerts and everything. But no, I, I I'm just uh, my point I was making was it was good to. to Having seen all the people I've seen, I also add Iron Maiden to that list because, yeah, I'm going to see all everybody else. I saw Tom Petty. I saw fucking, I mean, everybody else you can name. But Iron Maiden definitely was, I, I just really felt like, wow, I'm glad I said yes to that, you know? Sometimes you're like, you say yes to stuff and you're like, I shouldn't have said yes to this. Yeah. You know? And then other times you say no to things, you're like, man, I should have said yes to that. I should have did that. So it's nice when uh you say, Yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do that. Because you're it's surprising you change, you know, could change your opinion sometimes. Like I said, I have a I have a much greater appreciation for the for the band now that I didn't have before after seeing them live and uh 
And Rush was definitely that way. If you missed, listen, if you missed out seeing, if you missed out seeing Rush, uh, I'm sorry. They're, they're another one of those bands where you do like kind of just the same analogy I'm making with uh, Iron Maiden as well. Even if you weren't a huge fan, you, you really should have saw them live. That, see them live. I've, I've seen it just like the Iron Maiden thing did with me. I, I've seen it, man. I, I've taken people. I've seen it happen. It's, the transformation is complete. It's something about there's certain bands that are like that, man, where you can listen to all their records and watch videos of them and everything. And, it, you know, it's cool or whatever. But then you go and see them live and, and there's, it transforms you. Something happens. And then you're hooked after that. Rush is definitely one of those bands. And I've seen it happen. I've taken people that are, you know, just kind of whatever about them, you know. Yeah, they're cool, whatever. And then, you no, listen, next time they come to town, you're going with me. I'll get the tickets. You got to drive. We're going to go see Rush. You're going to get your fucking mind blown. You ready? I miss that. I miss that. That was a lot of fun because 100% success rate, even with girlfriends that I took in the past. And, you know, traditionally, women uh, are not Iron Maiden or uh, Rush fans, but I think a lot more with Iron Maiden. There's a lot more. Was, I mean, there was plenty of chicks at the Iron Maiden concerts, and there was always plenty of chicks at Rush concerts I ever went to. Even back in the day, there was. People used to always say that. But I always saw women at Rush shows, even from the very earliest ones I went to in the early 90s, uh, Roll the Bones tour. But I, I saw... I just, you know, I did just miss that, uh, you know. I miss seeing that when you take somebody to a show to, of a band, any band, you know, I've seen having more more than just him, but I think that's when you know you've got, um, you know, when you got a special band, when they have that ability to change someone's opinion in such a profound way, but not just change their opinion, change their opinion, and then make them a lifelong fan, a diehard lifelong fan. You know, it's crazy to see that. I've seen that a few times, and that's when I think, you know, you have the best bands. I mentioned another one, kind of like that experience I talked about earlier. Um, this was 20 years ago. This is crazy because he just died. He just passed away recently. Uh, Eddie Money. Uh, me and my brother, I was, how I was, I was 23. My brother was like 15, I think. And uh, it was this little, you know, like local fe like festival in the suburbs here in Dallas. It was the, the Wildflower Festival in Richardson. And I can't remember who, because we went a couple of times. I want to say it was when we saw the Beach Boys. We saw the Beach Boys one time there, and we saw uh, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revisited one year. And one time we saw Peter Frampton. But I think it was the Beach Boys when Eddie Money was opening. And, uh, you know, I knew, at the time, I knew the stuff that was on classic rock radio. So, you know, Two Tickets to Paradise. Shaken, take me home tonight, you know. And so we were, you know, it was we got there early because we wanted to get a good spot, and so we was on kind of a, like a grassy hill thing, and you know, blank, everybody had blankets and chairs spread out, and it was still daylight outside, you know. The it was kind of in the evening as the sun was going down, and Eddie Money got up there. And it wasn't any of the original people he had in his band. And they all looked really young. I think some of them, I know later he had his kids in the band. I think so, even then he had some of his kids in the band. There were real young people. But man, he got up there and just slayed. And I was shocked. Me and my brother were shocked. Because I was 23. My brother was 15. And we knew every single song that he played. And we never owned an Eddie Money record. Nobody in my family ever owned an Eddie Money record. These were songs. I just he. That's when you realize, holy shit! Because there were songs he had that I didn't even know was his. There was one song he had I thought was a, I didn't get it, I thought it was a fucking White Snake song, and it's an Eddie Money song, uh, "Walk on Water." If I could walk on water, if I could find a way to choose. 
If I could walk on water with you, believe in me, my love is true. That one, I thought that was fucking White Snake. I'm like, dude, that's any money, and which is hit after hit. Take me home tonight. Uh, what was the? Uh, I think I'm in love. I think I'm in love with killer fucking song. Uh, baby, hold on to me. Oh, what a killer song! Baby, hold on to me is hit after hit. I, I, I mean, me and my brother were blown away, blown away, dude. We were like anybody, <laughs> whatever. You fuck anybody, you know what I'm saying? When we got there, the fuck this guy, fucking old fucking fart. I was 23, my brother was 15. We were like, you know, but I think Creedence, it may not have been Beach Boys. I know once I was up there, it might have been Creedence Clearwater revisited who we were seeing. It was like all the guys from Creedence Clearwater except John Fogarty, you know what I'm saying? It was good though. But Eddie Money just came out and murdered. I mean, murdered. Hit after hit. We were like going, how do we know every single song, one of these songs? We knew every song. Every song, we knew it. We were singing along. We knew the words. How do we know the words? Every single song, because that's how iconic that shit was, man. The guy had 24, <laughs> 20, 20, I mean, it's like Beatles numbers. He had like 24 songs in the, in the Hot 100. It's crazy. Uh, and the guy was a former NYPD beat cop. Who became a rock star. Dude, you'll never see that happen again. Never in this world will that ever happen again. It's crazy. Crazy story. But uh, that was one of those times, man. It, it doesn't happen very often. I love it when it happens. It, it seems like it might have happened. I went to, my brother and sister went to ACL, Austin City Limits Music Festival in 2005 and 2006. It seems like there was some, there was a few times it happened there. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yes, I, I do remember another one where it happened there. For me, anyway, uh, I love it when it happens. I love that. There was a few at, at, at those because you'll go to these festivals like that. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those big um, multi stage, multi day outdoor festivals that last like three days, you know, and you go all three days and they start at like noon and or fucking and they go till 11 to, at night for three days. And um, sometimes you'll be waiting to see a specific group you know so you'll stay you'll go camp at a stage down in front and just stay there all day which means you got to watch every band that comes on on that stage that day regardless of whether you like them or not and um so occasionally that would happen i love it when that happens when you see a band and you're like i don't fuck these guys you know fuck these and you go see them you see them live you're like holy shit i was wrong i love that or holy shit i had no idea that that that's great too and that's how the Eddie Money thing was. I mean, I, I, I'll just never forget that. I, I still remember. We were blown away, dude. We couldn't believe it. And they, look, every song sounded like the record. I mean, it sounded like the record. His voice was phenomenal. He was drunk. That's the other great thing about it. He was fucking wasted. I forgot to mention, that's the best part of the whole story. He was fucking wasted. Wasted. I'm talking about stumbling drunk. And he delivered these songs like the pristine versions on the record. The band was tight. The solos and stuff were all there. He played the harmonica. He played the saxophone. It was insane. And he was drunk at <laughs> drunker than fuck. He was like 10 out of 10 lay. He drunk dude. Fucking drunk. He, he, hey, Dallas, what's going on? Hey. Between songs, it's slurring. Hey, I'm going to Dallas, man. My sister lives in Irving, man. I'm dead. Take me home tonight. And then singing that fucking voice. I feel a hunger. There's a hunger. I mean, did you, you're like, God, how does he do it? Wasted. Wasted. Maybe the drunkest person I ever saw on stage, and I saw Guns N' Roses when they did the tour with Metallica when I was in high school. And those guys were drunk. Eddie Money was drunker than Guns N' Roses in their prime. Not kidding you. Mark it. You heard it here first. Not kidding you. <laughs> dude was a pro. That dude, and I think at that point, too, he had even like, he wasn't even on the hard drugs anymore. I think he was just, he was just a drunk at that point. But he had been on the fucking nose candy and all that stuff back in the 80s, too. But his voice was pristine, man. It was just one of those things where like, you know, we were like laughing about Eddie Money. What was the other one? 
there's a couple times I guess that happened at at Music Fest. I'm trying to remember one specifically where I was just like, "Wow!" Or, you know, where you kind of you're like, "Yeah." There's there's been a bunch. I'm trying to think of one specifically off the top of my head. I don't know. Anyway, I love when that happens. It's fantastic. But it is an interesting phenomenon, you know, how you can, I mean, what is it? What is it that makes that change in it? I I think it has something to do with the communal aspects of it and uh, the physical feeling of, um, of air moving from the speakers. That's what I think it is. It's, it's definitely a senses thing where I don't know where it hits you, where it hits your senses in such a way where that even listening to it on, you know, on vinyl on a good sound system or something, you know, just doesn't quite do it. I think that's what it is. I think it's the volume and just the, the, the emotional element of it. And I think it's a lot of things that are happening all at once that don't happen when you're listening to something or watching playback, you know, even if it's on Blu-ray or something, there is something like that. Oh, I can think of it. Oh, here's another example. Uh, I'm still not a big, I'm still not a big fan of this person, but it did make me go, okay, I'm not going to hate on them anymore. Dave Matthews. Uh, this was like 2001. I knew these, uh, fucking Uber rich, like elite fucking Dallas kids. They were this band I was in at the time. They were big fans of, and stuff. So they would, these guys, were, I mean, these guys were fucking, you know, their parents were billionaires, millionaires, oil money, shit like that. And somehow these guys, just this weird little band that I played keyboards to say, these guys were into it. And, uh, so they met me after the show one night and man, they would just come to our shows and come to our parties and stuff and just bring, I mean, they would bring, it was the first time I ever saw like, um, I ever saw marijuana that came in a, uh, in a doctor's, like a, a pill bottle. Like, it wasn't just somebody just put it in there. It was like, this was like actual, like, medical stuff. It was the first time I'd ever seen these. I don't know where these kids got this shit at. And uh, they had this, you know, they had this shit. And it fucking blew my head off. And uh, so they were like, well, they came to one of our shows one night. And they were like, hey, man, uh, we're going to, uh, we got these tickets to go see Dave Matthews. But we don't want to go to the concert we're just going to go out to the parking lot and sell them. They're a hundred bucks each. And if you sell, if you help us sell these tickets, if you sell you, it will give you one to sell. And if you sell it, you can keep the money. And if we don't sell them, then I'll just roll like five blunts and we'll go sit in the nosebleeds at Texas stadium and watch the concert and just say, fuck it. You know, even though we don't care about the I'm like, okay, so that's what we ended up doing. And uh, I, after that, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to hate on Dave Matthews Band anymore. They were phenomenal. Before that, I was like, now fuck them. Fuck that fucking bullshit. Fuck that fucking guy. Fuck his fucking... <laughs> fuck his retarded ass singer. Fuck that guy. Once I saw him live, I was you know what? Not going to hate anymore. Not my thing. Not going to buy the records. But I get it. I'm not going to hate on that anymore. That's... uh it's, it's it's interesting. It, 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 I like when I like when that happens too. It's just when you can have a different opinion about something. But I, what I'm really keen on here is why does the live performance element? Why is it so impactful upon someone who was kind of middle of the road, lukewarm about this band previously? You know, I, again, I think it's a combination of all those things, the, the, the volume, the sound, the, the experience, the, the shared experience, I think, too, with the audience. You know, when, uh, when there's a moment, in, and I've experienced this a lot at Rush shows, and not really very much at a lot of other shows, but it happened a lot at Rush shows where there's a shared moment where, you know what I mean? It's like where, where the hair stands up on the back on your arms, you get goosebumps, and then, but yet... Every single person you look for a mile around you also is having it too. That exact moment. It's just one of those, you know, shared moment things. I think it's that, a combination of things, you know. 
but it's just to me it's a fascinating phenomenon that I've experienced both experienced and seen ex- other people experience where your entire opinion about something that was so strong before can be changed just by simply seeing, you know, hearing people say that you got to see them live, man, you got to see them live. And you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But I, I have a greater appreciation for that now. Um, Cause I mean, I've seen, I have done that. I mean, I have people go, Oh, you got, you got to see that, man. You got to see live. Like, I don't really into the CD. Oh, man, the CD, dude, doesn't do justice, man. You got to see it live, man. And then you go see it live. And most of the time, you're like, yeah, you're right. It was fucking badass. But sometimes you go and you're like, eh, nah, still not feeling it, dude. <laughs> Thanks for playing. Thanks for trying. Still not feeling it, dude. Not going to do it. No, I still don't get it or like it but i there is something uh, there's something to that though i think it's a very interesting phenomenon that i don't know exists that's why i think it's worthy to talk about and mention i don't know exists in any other realm where but then again maybe this uh i think this also was probably why you had in the past because i've something i've researched a lot is uh you know as well as all these other things is it is personality cults. Um, you know, it's one of the many things I think I'm a bit of an expert in because I've spent a lot of time researching it and, and, and its origins and how far it goes back. And that came as a result of my research and studying into the priest class and into, uh, you know, ancient cults and also how it ties into music, you know, Dionysian cults, cults of Dionysus and all that. And, uh, I, I've seen this thing where these personality cults and these things get built up and how it's always been there. And uh, it still exists today. And this, this is exactly what uh, I think a lot of people who became extreme figures in religion, whether it, you know, whether you want to talk about Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, whoever, Council of Kowadal, Awanis, um, you know, you had these, it was something about the public performance, you know, you, I mean, look at Hitler. Mussolini, I mean, he's, you know, address these mega crowds and whatnot, and, and, and you, could, it would, you could really whip people up, and there's something about the live energy. I don't know. It, it's a fascinating thing. But it, it's, it's interesting that that's it just experiencing, you know, a band or someone speaking or something like that live can be that transformative for somebody where you're like, oh, all of a sudden they, be, they just become uh, a mega fan, you know, whereas before maybe they were kind of lukewarm on, on it. Fascinating. And I think it definitely, when you really get down to the core of it, you start to understand how these personality calls, whether they be for, Senators, congressmen, presidents, kings, queens, whoever it may be, bands, musicians, actors, podcasters, whoever it might be. But I think it's, uh, yeah, it is a fascinating thing where the, where, where the, where the live or the um, something that's just delivered directly to the people, you know, not just like, okay, you make a record, you hear it, whatever great and i like listening to records because i like to hear what people do in studios recording techniques and production and all that a lot of people don't give a shit about that stuff especially nowadays but um the i lost my train of thought again i was going somewhere with that 
I don't know. Let me think about it. But, uh, you know, listening to a record, it's just, you know, listening to a record. But it, 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 there are people where, you know, people will get way fanatical. And I'm not talking about those examples, but specifically the, the thing where eh, you're just kind of am about something, and, but then you see it live. And that's, uh, I heard a lot, I've heard that experience has happened a lot with people who are Maiden fans where people were kind of like, ah, you know, I'm okay on them. Then you see them live. It didn't really give me that, but it definitely made me say, okay, you know, I get it now. And again, never having, have, when you know every song, same, that's the whole thing I was making with the Eddie Money analogy as well. That's when you know you've got someone iconic. I mean, when you can go see, I, I, I probably can't think of any, I'm trying to think if there's another example that's ever happened to me with any other act. Um, not really. Well, I guess maybe when I was a teenager, oh man, this is hilarious. When I was a teenager, I had to go to, to Branson a few times, uh, Branson, Missouri with my grandparents. I was like 14, 15. Oh, well, I was a punk ass. Oh, what a punk ass I was. I was a punk ass, dude. Like that was the last thing I wanted to do. What? At 14 or 15, you motherfuckers want me to go into the middle of nowhere in the Ozarks and listen to country music? Are you out of your goddamn mind? You're kidding me. We're going to be gone for like a week? Motherfucker. That's during baseball season, too. I got to miss baseball for this shit? Ah, damn. I was pissed. So I was a snot nut, so I'd... I had that was back in the Walkman days, you know what I'm saying? We're not we're talking about pre disc, we're doing cassette Walkman days. And so I'd have my cassette Walkman, I'd have my cassettes with me loaded up with some like well, whatever jams I was jamming out to. And uh Oh man, I would go to these fucking country concerts and I'd be sitting in there the fucking in a country concert at fucking fucking Branson and there's a show, a live show going on like ten feet from my face. And I'm sitting there like a little punk ass with headphones on, listening to, listening to my shit on blast. Oh, how disrespectful is that? Oh, that's like the most disrespectful. Like, I don't even, I don't even care if you're great. I'm not even giving you a chance to suck. Come on, buddy. I'd give him a chance. No one should give me given a chance to suck, Beavis. Oh, oh, come on, buddy. I'd give him a chance. I think you're being a little hard on Ozzy. I'm being a little what on Ozzy? Hard on Ozzy. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> that's harsh, dude. That's harsh. I don't even get... I'm going to listen to my fucking headphones on while you're playing live. And, uh... Well, one of the times... Two of the times... I, I, one of the, I think one time we saw Glenn Campbell... And uh, I forget what the first song he played was, but it was a song I knew. And I was like, how the fuck do I know that song? I never fucking listened to Glenn Campbell. And then, so I didn't put the, I took the headphones off. And then, like the next song he did, it was like a song I knew. It was like Galveston or some shit. I'm like, well, I don't fucking know all these songs. And uh, then the next one we went to uh, was Merle Haggard. My dad was a big Merle Haggard fan, so I heard Merle Haggard a lot growing up. So I, you know, I knew, I knew a good amount of his material uh, already. But we saw this show with my grandparents, and uh, and he just, uh, I mean, he just destroyed it, destroyed it, dude. This was like early nineties. Merle Haggard, oh, holy! I mean, I'd heard his music. My dad was a fan, so I'd heard his music. But man. It was one of those, another one of those moments. Every single you knew, every, you knew every single song. How the fuck do I know it? I knew every single song you played. There wasn't a song you played that I did not know. You know, and here I am, this young fucking punk, and got my headphones on and stuff, and I'm all fucking, you know, grunge metaled out or whatever I was fucking banging out to at that time. I had a little meet and greet after it was over. You got to go up and you'll get a little, you pay 
five bucks and give you like a picture, a glossy picture, you know, you get it signed. And it just floored me. Uh, it really did. It blew me away. His show, he killed it. And I, it was, I mean, it was had the impact of like a rock concert. And it totally changed my mind about like what country could be in that it didn't all suck, you know? That was really the defining moment, I think, for me. Because I'd always heard good country when I was growing up. My dad was, you know, uh, into all the, the outlaw stuff, Willie and all that stuff. So I was familiar with all that stuff. But So I was like 14 or 15. So we got the, the meet and greet. And I'll never forget, I said, uh, Mr. Haggard, I just wanted to come tell you that uh, I'm not a fan of country music at all. And, uh, and you, you, you just blew me away. That was so incredible. You just blew, I'm, I'm, I, I don't even know what to say. And it shook him. It shook him. It, it, it shook him, dude. He looked me right. He took me dead in the eye. I'll never forget it. It kind of, his eyes kind of watered up. You know, I mean, here's, this guy did prison time. You know what I'm saying? Like he really felt that I, that I was really affected he, by his performance. And it, 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 I could see it. In his eyes, and he looked me dead in the eye, grabbed my hand, and gripped it real hard. And he said, "Son, you have no idea how good that makes me feel, and you have no idea how much I needed to hear that right now. Thank you." And he signed my picture, and I was off. That was my real haggard moment. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's incredible. That's what I'm saying. I love that though. I love when uh, you know something you were just so just whatever about meh about before can change you so profoundly so quickly. It's an amazing thing. It really is. Oh, you know, that's what we should all be, you know, striving for. Those moments, you know. Putting ourselves in the opportunity to have those type of moments where it's like taking a chance, you know? So next time somebody says, hey, you want to go to the show, even if it's not your favorite band, even if somebody you're kind of uh, about, say yes. Say yes, go. Especially if, you know, they're offering you to buy you a ticket. But even if they're not, say yes. Hey, you want to go to the show with me? If this band you're not into, go. You never know, man. You just never know how, if, if you might, it may not happen, but you might have that experience that uh, you never thought you were going to have. And it can be profound. It can change you, you know, change your whole perspective and look out on things. Which then, in turn, attracts, starts to attract you to a different type of people in different crowds sometimes. And, and, and you start to find and meet people you wouldn't have met any other way. Music's happened a lot like that for me throughout my life, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's it's just fascinating how that happens. But it's a it's a fantastic journey, and uh, in the twelve years that I've been doing this, it's, it's so many profound changes have happened to me. It's it, it's incredible, and uh, we just continue to be reaffirmed at every point that this is what I was put here to do. So, I think without further ado, I'm going to get back to doing that here. I just wanted to have a special twelve year anniversary broadcast with you guys. Uh, we were supposed to have a money bomb today. Wanted to have everybody get in contributions, see if we could get, uh, you know, a good amount of our, or at least like up to a thousand or something of our uh, overall goal for the month race today. I didn't really push it. Made a couple of posts on Facebook. Um, I think we got in like 150 today. So, uh, yeah, you know, please participate and, uh, and help us raise as much as we can, you know, so I can get back to, uh, I'm going to be, I got to get back to doing this. I got to get back working on the films right now. And I'll be back here with you tomorrow for another uh, show of just news since I didn't really do all, all the news I wanted to do tonight and decided just to do a special kind of reflective show and a music show. And people always talk about how they love when I talk about music. So there you go. Thought I'd throw something different at you tonight. You know what I mean? It doesn't always have to be the same way, does it? I know you get used to the way I do it and 
we'll continue to do that way. But, you know, hey, I like throwing a fucking curveball in there sometimes. Please support my work. Make a contribution. Get yourself some downloads. I'm grateful to each and every one of you out there. All of you out there have helped me get this far. And uh, fuck it, man. Let's do it. Let's, let's go for many, many more. All right. I love you guys. We'll see you next time. Take care.